Hey, Flipped Geometry, how you doing? We are going to be talking today about uh, 2.3 conditionals and biconditionals. We're continuing our discussion of the rules of logic um, that are going to underpin everything that we do with geometry as we make proofs. So, um, BJU Press, fourth edition geometry book, lesson 2.3, conditionals and biconditionals. Let's jump right into it. Quite often in logical reasoning, you're going to have one statement that hinges upon another. In order for this statement to be true, the underlying statement must be true first. And that kind of situation is called a conditional. A conditional statement is a statement in the form if P then Q, which is denoted as P arrow Q, and often read as P implies Q, or if P then Q. So these are conditional statements. Um, if you are a mammal, then you have body hair. So if you are a mammal, we can imply that you have body hair. Even if you're a whale or a dolphin, there's a small amount of hair on those mammals. So a conditional statement, if P, then Q. We're going to get to know these very well. These statements have two parts, and we will identify the if phrase as the hypothesis and the Q phrase as the conclusion. So if P, then Q, if you are a mammal, that part is the hypothesis then you have body hair. That would be the conclusion, okay? So uh, the P statement or the first statement doesn't have to be P and Q, but in this example it is. The first part of the statement is the hypothesis. The second part is the conclusion. So let's take a statement that is not a perfect if-then and write it as an if-then. There are no clouds in the sky, so it is not raining. That's not really an if-then yet. We need to massage it a little bit and get it into that stage. So Let's identify the hypothesis. There are no clouds in the sky. And let's identify the conclusion. It's not raining. So rather than saying there are no clouds in the sky, so it is not raining, let's say if there are no clouds in the sky, then it is not raining. Okay? So if then statements. If there's no clouds, it can't be raining. Let's do another one. School will be canceled when a blizzard hits. Um, school will be canceled is the result, actually, right? A blizzard hitting is the hypothesis. This triggers that. So you can have if-then statements that are given to you backwards, and you have to be able to determine, well, what triggered what? So let's look at how this would work. If a blizzard hits, that's the hypothesis, then school will be canceled. So as you're doing your, your uh, classwork, don't just think that if it's the first part of the sentence, it's the if. That's not necessarily true. It can get rearranged. A triangle has three sides. Well, here, the having three sides is the conclusion. A triangle, if the thing is a triangle, that's the hypothesis, right? So if a figure is a triangle, we had to add a lot of words to make one word a hypothesis statement, but it's the same meaning. If a figure is a triangle, then it has three sides, okay? Um, let's move on. If you need more help with these, go back and watch them again. The truth table on these guys is kind of weird. Um, we would think that uh, something like a, a conjunction would be there, where if the hypothesis or the conclusion is false, then the statement is wrong. But actually, the rules of logic work the other way around. Uh, If-then statements are almost always true. The only way that you can falsify a conditional statement is if the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false. So let me show you an example here. Um, here's a, a conditional, wow, here's a conditional truth statement. True, true, true. If P, then Q. Yes. If P, then Q. Oh, but this says that that should happen and this is, it's not happening. It's false. That doesn't work. That makes sense. But why is it true that if you have a hypothesis that's false, it doesn't matter what the, what the conclusion is? The answer is true. Why is that? Well, Think of it this way. If it's raining, then I will wear a windbreaker. Let's make that statement. Now, you could look at me when it's raining and say, he's wearing a windbreaker. He was telling the truth. Or he's not wearing a windbreaker. He's a no good, dirty, rotten liar. But if it's not raining outside, then whether or not I'm wearing a windbreaker can't falsify the statement. Because I only told you I'd wear a windbreaker if it's raining. If it's not raining, then this doesn't matter, and I probably told the truth. 
you can't really know for sure, right? So you can only falsify a, con a conditional statement in this situation where the hypothesis is true but the conclusion is false. If that doesn't make sense, go back and look at it again and we'll do a bunch of examples in class, okay? Now, a converse of a conditional is reversing the direction. Instead of if P then Q, now we're saying, oh, backwards, if Q then P. So we, we back the train up through the argument. Oftentimes, converses wind up not working, but we'll, we'll see how this works. So the converse of a conditional is obtained by reversing the hypothesis and inclusion. Instead of P, if P then Q, we say if Q then P. So um, for an inverse, the inverse of a conditional statement is obtained by negating the hypothesis and the conclusion. The inverse of P, if P then Q, it would be not P then not Q. If it's raining outside, I will wear a windbreaker. Converse, if I'm wearing a windbreaker, it's because it's raining outside. Inverse, if it's not raining outside, I will not wear a windbreaker. Okay, so there, these are some ways that you can flip these statements around. Okay, we'll go through again lots of examples in class, so don't get too stressed if you're losing it here. Trust me, it does make sense. A contrapositive is the other way. That's where you have flipped the order and inverted them and said no. So contrapositive is negating and reversing the hypothesis and the conclusion. So instead of if P then Q, now we say if not Q, then not P. So if I am not wearing a windbreaker, then it is not raining, okay? You've switched the order and you've negated both statements. That's a contrapositive. All right, let's look at this here. Some examples. Write the converse, the inverse, and the contrapositive of the following conditional. If the measure of an angle is 135 degrees, then the angle is obtuse. That's the if then. So the converse just switches the order if the angle is obtuse, then it's 135 degrees. Well, we understand that that's not true, right? Something about that doesn't work because the 135 degrees is just one many, one of many angles that would be obtuse. It could be, uh, it could be 160 degrees. It could be 94 degrees, right? So um, converses often don't bear out the same truth answers that their conditional statements do, okay? Um, let's look at the inverse. If the measure of an angle is not 135, then the angle is not obtuse. Well, again, that does not always carry out, right? That's a false statement. Because um, if the angle is 132, then it's not 135, but it is still an obtuse angle. Okay, so that would be an example of the inverse. And then a contrapositive we negate and we reverse the order. If an angle is not obtuse, then its measure is not 135 degrees. And that actually is true, because if it's not 135, then, uh, sorry, if it's not obtuse, then it's definitely not 135 degrees. If it's not obtuse, then it's a straight angle, or it's less than 90, and none of those could be 135. Contrapositives usually do have the same truth statement truth value as the original statement. The contrapositive rule, a conditional, is equivalent to its contrapositive. So however the true and falses work for a, a conditional statement, the same true or falses will work for the contrapositive. They have the same truth values. Okay? All right. Combining a conditional and its converse with the word and forms something called a biconditional. And this is a little bit strange. A biconditional is a conjunction in the form of if P then Q and if Q then P, okay? Um, and in order for a biconditional to, to work, both of those have to be true, right? So biconditionals are often written as P if and only if Q. If and only if is, is really this, if P then Q and if Q then P, okay? Biconditionals are very hard to satisfy. Um, so let's look at an example of the table here. P and Q, true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. Let's look first at the conditional, if P then Q. Both of those have to be true. The hypothesis true and the conclusion false is the only way that that is falsified. 
if the hypothesis is false, then the conclusion doesn't matter and the statement is true. Let's look at the inverse now. True, true, true. Hypothesis is false. Conclusion is true, but if the hypothesis is false, it doesn't matter. So the statement is still true. True, false, that's the only way that this one can be negated. Okay? And then false, false is true because the hypothesis is false. It doesn't matter what the conclusion is. So here's my conditional. Here's my inverse. Now I'm going to say and. In order for this to be true, both the conditional and the inverse must be true. So true, true, true. Any way that that's mismatched, the answer is false. And then true, true, true. So this is the common answer to a, uh, a biconditional. Okay, a biconditional. Um, take a moment and review that and look at that until it makes sense to you. Here's just an interesting uh, artifact of these kinds of problems, is that um, the equivalent disjunction theorem. If P then Q gives you the same answers in a truth table as the uh, disjunction, the or statement of not P or Q. Um, and this table just demonstrates that, right? So P, Q, true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. Not P, so it's the opposite of this column, okay? And then if P then Q, so true, true, true. True, false, false. If the hypothesis is false, the conclusion doesn't matter. True, true. So the answer for if P then Q is true, false, true, true. Now let's look at this thing. Not P or Q. This is the not P column. This is the Q column. In order for this to work, either this or this has to be true. So true, false, yes. False, false, no. True, true, yes. False, true. Yes. So it's just demonstrating that you get the same answers, right? And then if you were to write a biconditional statement with if P then Q, if and only if, not P or Q, boy, that's confusing to read, then you'd get all true statements because they would all agree. Okay. True, true, true. False, false, true. Uh, true, true, true. True, true, true. This would, this would unify everything. So um, the, these sorts of problems are going to be fewer and far between, but it's an interesting uh, artifact and an interesting um, outcome of comparing the truth values for these two kinds of statements. Okay, We're going to move on to some examples here. Change the following conditional into an equivalent disjunction. If a child disobeys, then he will be corrected. Take a moment and think about that. It might take you a minute even to understand the question. What they're looking for is to, to form that equivalent disjunction where you negate the hypothesis and then use a or operator, right? The negative and then the disjunction. So if a child disobeys, then he will be corrected. That's if P then Q. But we want it to say not P or Q. If a child disobeys is the hypothesis. We're going to negate that. We're going to say a child uh, does not disobey, right? And then we're going to use or instead of the then. He will be corrected. So um, negate the hypothesis and use or as the connective. So a child obeys, which is, I guess, the opposite of disobeying. A child obeys or he will be corrected, right? And so this just, this would give you the same sort of idea as the uh, as the biconditional. A child disobeys if and only if he is corrected. Um, so these are some interesting ways of flipping this around. We're going to do this together in class a whole bunch. So if it doesn't make sense to you right now, that's okay. You can look at this again until you understand or uh, make note of your questions and we'll go over it tomorrow in class. Until then, God bless you, Jesus loves you, and so do I. Good night.